Greetings, sisters and brothers, comrades. I'm Milton Alimadi. Some of you know me through some of my YouTube interviews and postings. And many of you also know me from my series called the African History Club. I haven't been posting on that channel because lately I've been doing a weekly podcast with two comrades, a Kenyan sister named Sister Nduku and a brother from Nigeria named Adesoyi. And that podcast is called Kumbukeni, which is like the Swahili word meaning remember or remembrance. So we use wisdom from the past, from our ancestors, to discuss how their relevance to some of the contemporary challenges that we face as Africana people all over the world. So I urge you and invite you to join us on that podcast every Sunday at 12 noon Eastern time. And that podcast is on YouTube. So it's youtube.com forward slash at Kumbukeni and then the number one. And Kumbukeni is spelled K-U-M-B-E Kumbu Kenny. K-U-M B-U-K-E-N-I, Kumbu Kenny, the Swahili word for remembrance. I want to make sure I have it right one more time. Kumbu Kenny, K-U-M-B-U-K-E-N-I. So welcome to Kumbu Kenny every Sunday at 12 noon U.S. Eastern Time. I hope you'll join us. So today, the purpose of this short message is to let you know about some of the challenges that I've been facing with my book. Some of you are familiar with the book, Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. This book was published in June 2021 by Kendall Hunt Publishing Company. The book critiques and analyzes three centuries of demonization of Africa, Africans, and African descendants in European literature, European media, and European American writings as well. So it starts off by analyzing the writings of the so-called explorers, Europeans who went to Africa and found rivers, lakes, mountains, and even countries that already had African names and gave them European names. And in fact, how did they, quote-unquote, discover? They were led by African guides <laughs> to make these so-called discoveries. So after analyzing that, then I critique the writings of the journalists, professional writers that started getting sent to Africa around the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, up to the contemporary era. I also critique the writings in National Geographic magazine, in Time Magazine, and in Newsweek. But I think what breathes life, what breathes life into my book was the material that I discovered in the archives of the New York Times. I found personal correspondences between reporters sent by the New York Times to Africa and editors here in New York City. And I want to read some excerpts from some of this material. So, for example, there was a famous reporter who had already won the Pulitzer Prize two times by the time the New York Times sent him to Africa to cover decolonization. His name is Homer Bigart. Many people who are now familiar with him through my book refer to him as Homer Bigart. Let me read Part of the letter he wrote to his editor, whose name was Emmanuel Friedman from Africa. Quote, I'm afraid I cannot work up any enthusiasm for the emerging republics. The politicians are either crooks or mystics. Dr. Nkrumah, who was of course Ghana's first prime minister and later president, is a Henry Wallace in burnt court. I vastly prefer the primitive Bush people after all, cannibalism may be the logical antidote to this population explosion everyone talks about. 
Right, so this racist animus by Bigart or Bigot was translated directly into his writings as well, the purported stories that he filed from Africa that were printed in the New York Times. So let me give you a sampling of something he wrote in Nigeria. Article was published January 31, 1960 in the New York Times under the despicable headline, Barbarian Cult Feared in Nigeria. Bigger wrote, a pocket of barbarism, barbarism still exists in eastern Nigeria, despite some success by the regional government in extending a crust of civilization over the tribe of the pagan Isi. A momentary lapse into cannibalism marked the closing days of 1959 when two men killed in a tribal clash were partly consumed by enemies in the Cross River country below Obubra. Garroting was the society's favorite method of execution. None of the victims was eaten. Now he contradicts what he has said in his article earlier on, at least not by society members. Less lurid but equally effective ways were found to dispose of them, and so on and so on. Now, did his editor here in New York, Emmanuel Friedman, say, let me get this racist guy out of Africa? Not at all. In fact, he enjoyed this kind of writing from Big Art. And here's the proof. This is part of a letter that Emmanuel Friedman sent to Big Art in Africa, dated March 4, 1960. This is just a note to say hello and to tell you how much your peerless prose from the Badlands is continuing to give us and your public. By now, you must be American journalism's leading expert on sorcery, witchcraft, cannibalism, and all the other exotic phenomena indigenous to darkest Africa. All this and nationalism too. Where else but in the New York Times can you get all this for nickel? I guess that's reference to the fact that the New York Times was a nickel or five cents in 1960. Now, Bigard then goes on to cover decolonization in what was Belgian Congo. And he wrote a letter to his editor here in New York complaining that he could not find pygmies, who, by the way, in history, are one of the most maligned people in Africa, in most of the Western writings about Africa the demonization of pygmies in particular. So he complains that he can't find pygmies because he wanted to invite to interview them on what was the meaning of independence. But lo and behold, when his article was published on, article was published, the letter he wrote was dated May 29, 1960. And then his article was published on June 5, 1960, about Congo's independence. And it appears under the contemptuous headline, Magic of Freedom and Chance Congolese. In other words, <laughs> the Congolese have no concept of what Uhuru is. To them, it's magic. Quote, as the hour of Belgian, as the hour of freedom, from Belgium rule nears independence is being chanted by Congolese all over this immense land, even by pygmies in the forest, the pygmies that it could not locate, right? Independence is an abstraction not easily grasped by Congolese, and they are seeking concrete interpretations. To the forest pygmy, independence means a little more salt, a little more beer. The Congolese did not understand independence after the genocide by King Leopold in the latter part of the 19th century and under the diabolical colonial rule when the Congolese is estimated to have lost anywhere from six to 10 million peoples, and they don't know what independence is. It means a little more salt to pygmies. 
This is the kind of article that was appearing in the New York Times. And the type of diabolical agenda to demonize Africa was even worse than I had anticipated before I did my research. So for example, I discovered a letter from a reporter named Lloyd Garrison, who is a descendant of the famous abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. He had been based in Nigeria and he covered the Biafran War of Secession. And he wrote a letter on June 5, 1967 to his editors here in New York, complaining about something they had inserted into an article that he wrote that was published on May 31, 1967. And the reference was to small pagan tribes dressed in leaves in Nigeria. Get this right. This is something he did not see, he did not witness, and was not there. But editors sitting here in New York felt his article that he submitted perhaps was not tribal enough. <laughs> and from thin air, concocted Nigerians wearing grass leaves and put it in his article. This is something we would call, I guess, fake news nowadays. So people that have read my book say they were actually, first of all, surprised that I managed to get a publisher for it. And now the same people are not surprised that my own publisher is no longer printing this book and is only making the digital copy available. And how did I learn about this? Was I informed by my publisher? No. I was told by one of my own students at John Jay <laughs> when the student came to me and said, I can no longer get a copy of the book. So I went online to the publisher's website and lo and behold, I discovered it was true. Now this is the interesting part. When the book first came out in 2021, I got several decent royalty checks, meaning the book was moving. But then around 2020, I started getting complaints from people, contacted me directly, said they ordered the books, wait four months, more than six months to get the book. And some people say they never even got the book after ordering it. So the last straw was when my student told me that the publisher, and they know the reason why, and I would rather not speculate but it's clear they don't want the book to be widely available. Possibly because of its content? Should they not have made that decision before make, giving me the contract? Be that as it may, I've demanded for the return of my copyright so I can self-publish and make this book widely available. The publisher insists that I pay $3,000 to get the copyright back. I offered $500. The company official named Faith Doyle came back to me in an email message September 21st and said the publisher is insisting on $3,000. So I have launched a GoFundMe campaign so, then, so that I can reacquire my copyrights and make this book widely available and share this knowledge. The reviews were good. And people can go online and put review and then put the title, Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. And you will see the review. And there's a couple of write-ups about it as well. And I did some podcast interviews. And you'll find out more about this book and why I believe it deserves to be uh, widely read so we can share this knowledge. I hope you will share this video with others and that I can indeed get the support so I can raise the $3,000 to buy back the copyrights. I'm happy to say that we've already raised $510 in the last three days alone. And if you go to 
GoFundMe and look for the headline for the campaign is Regain Copyright My Book on Racism Toward Africa. And my personal email is malimadi at gmail.com. That's M A L L I M A D I at gmail.com. And I can send you more information in case you're not able to find the link to the GoFundMe campaign. So I hope I can get your support so that we can make sure that nobody censors this kind of historical examination of how Africa, Africans and people of African descent have been demonized in Western media because it helped us understand the perception toward Africans even in our contemporary time. So thank you for your time and thank you for taking the time to listen to my comments today.